<laughs> I'm sure you've, uh, you've had a lot of time to think about all these things. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind with me is, is like I said, you said, uh, a bit of depression. Um, we live in a world where uh, users are fully empowered to create, uh, and they do so. We all have phones, we all have cameras, uh, all of our photographers, writers, etc. But the institutions are not at all empowered to do the right thing. Am I correct? Eva? Well. <laughs> Um, so that's a <laughs> that has a lot of definitional problems. It depends on what you think the right thing is. But I, I no, I think um, institutions should feel empowered. It's true that the law perhaps doesn't necessarily empower them to do it, but I still think there's so much scope of um, helping with what you can. So I'm probably not as depressed as you right now, I think. I don't know. But, uh, what I mean is, you know, we all have access to very good phones, uh, the tools that you need to create anything, you know, all those billions of photos. But the tools, uh, in order for us as institutions to do the right thing, uh, finding out uh, through Martin's uh, uh, public domain charts or uh, orphan works or etc., are, are, are tremendously archaic. What I'm saying, terrifically difficult. Why don't we use better tools? Why, why is it so hard, Cedric? <laughs> well, the question should be for lawmakers, not for me. I think, well, in my case, I work for a company that tries to help people get empowered. You, yeah. I mean, we provide the sort of copyright infrastructure you can share there. Uh, the problem is that then, when users do it, when they share the photo and they share the videos, sometimes these videos are taken down because of um, uh, copyright notices, etc. And they blame us. They believe that we took down the work. Yeah. And when the problem is really the law and how rights holders uh, look at sharing, not all of them um, uh, forbid sharing uh, right. to, to be, to be uh, uh, fair, but uh, the question is much more uh, how do we accept this is a fundamental change mm -hmm. and how do we uh, have uh, institutions, not the control institutions, but uh, lawmakers understand that this is happening and it's not a threat to civilization, it's just good. But the thing, this, these changes have happened so quickly that maybe it's hard to have the legislator who works at a different speed, understand what is happening. Right, yeah. Well, I think uh, the understanding is sinking in. It's just that, uh, yeah, we're, we're running in two parallel tracks. Very fast technology uh, movements and user acceptance of it, and very slow-moving uh, law-making devices. Is that, uh, that's what I'm seeing, yeah. Yes. So what do we do in the meantime? We can't wait for Brussels to solve all our problems. How do we build that cultural commons of yours? Well, I think it is partially about taking some risks, calculated risk, and not just thinking, well, I have this whole collection of Walt Disney pictures, let, them, let me throw them all online under a CC0 license. I would say that's a risk too far. But I think that there are things that we can do, and I think there are a lot of artists, some of which are here, who really are very happy to see their stuff reused. Some of them know how to properly indicate that and use Creative Commons licenses. Some of them don't, but probably really don't care at all. It's the same thing with the orphan works, the diligent searches. It is necessary, and I understand why it's necessary, because you just can't be completely lazy and not think about it at all. But if you found a real film on a flea market, a diligent search is a completely ridiculous concept and I think at that stage you can take the risk and think well I'll digitize it and I'll put it available on my website and that's probably not going to cause any trouble. I was having a discussion with Melissa this morning about the fact that there is so little case law about things like that. I mean we do have some exceptions like the penguin and but there are very little cases where people say um, I'm going to sue you because you've put some of my works online and Sometimes maybe they can ask to take something down and when you do that, that will be enough and they won't, I mean, most people, it's different when you talk about really big corporate rights holders and that's a whole other issue, but a lot of artists, firstly, are happy to see things shared or secondly, would never sue you even if they're not happy because um, the same goes for cultural institutions, you just, they cannot afford to start a copyright litigation lawsuit, I would imagine. So I think you can take some risks, I think, it's tricky stuff, but I think there's such a big gray area, which 
I think we can play with a little bit without harming any artists in the process. Yeah. I would believe so as well, but uh, mm. we very often benefit actually from the Googles of the earth to take that risk for yeah. us uh, yes, before we do it ourselves. I mean, uh, I'm glad you raised the uh, issue of risk again because you, you did this in the presentation and you just answered saying, well, this is a question of risk. I was really intrigued and uh, fascinated at um, the examples you used with the artist, Jasper Rigo. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said, well, I studied his attitude uh, towards risk, and so, well, he accepts it, even mm -hmm. though he doesn't really know what's happened. What he does at a really small level, this is what my company has done for years at a big level. Uh, there would never be a search engine today if we had decided that the good way was to ask to every single owner of a, every single web page on the web to, uh, to give a license to index them. That simply doesn't scale. It cannot work. So you cannot la launch a search engine uh, by um, uh, asking people permission. And again, if you do this, if you want to stay on the safe side, nothing happens. So you take a risk. But the risk we take, or the risk the venture capitalists took here, is the risk that well, it's a bet. It's a financial bet. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But let's say it's a different world than the world of an artist. Uh, this artist decides to take a risk. This is simply not acceptable. Yeah. I mean, if for every use today, be it for search engine, be it for you or for my son, if we have to wonder, well, this is risky, you know, I don't want to raise my son in a world where I say to him, you know, when you post something online, maybe it's okay, maybe it's not, maybe it's illegal. That is not, sim that's not possible. In democratic society, you cannot, you must have clear rules. Again, I want to raise my son in a world where things are clear, where he has to know that when he does something online, it's okay, Oh, it's not. I cannot say to him, you know, you might go to jail here. <laughs> and again, this is about going to jail, because popular law is, um, is full of uh, uh, criminal sanctions. Uh, you, you know, there's a lot of punishment that can happen. When I talk to rights holders, they always, always say to me, well, look, for all these uses, for all these mashups, memes, uh, remixes, etc., look, we are not suing. Yes, but it may happen. And sometimes it does. Uh, so usually it goes in the press and that's how it stops. Mm. It's a question of repetition here. But still, again, uh, how can you accept to live in a world where everything we do, the most benign, the most uh, <laughs> uh, common act we do, is likely to put us in jail? It doesn't work. It's not acceptable. So the risk is not something we should live with. No, I think that, yeah. From a lawyer, that's talking like a lawyer, I completely agree. It's a binary thing. You're either within the law or outside of the law. And I think we should. I fully agree that we need to do everything we can to, to get out of this situation. But that's a longer term uh, thing. I think what, we, what I'm trying to solve now is what can we do in the meantime? So what I hear, if, if we want to do something useful, because then it's, it's more of a, let's say, a business decision. Is the risk bigger not doing anything and being completely irrelevant as a museum? Or is the risk bigger to, you know, tread on a few laws that, uh, that are still out there, right? Yeah, I think so. And, yeah. but, but it's not only a business decision, it's a really fundamental, yeah. philosophical, moral decision, moral ethical, decision yes. Yeah. If you're a cultural institution and you think that your best way is to do nothing, I think, yeah, I find that a shame. And I, it's easy for me to say, because I'm not, and I don't run the risk and I'm telling you all to take risks, whereas I do my research and ignore all of that. But, yeah. um, but no, I think, yeah, I think it is very important ethical discussion, definitely. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that um, I think we're, we're, we're coming across in, in this discussion and uh, for the past years or so is that um, we're out of the scan and dump phase, I think is one of the, the most favorite the tweets in, the, in this uh, discussion. Um, we should maybe look at things a bit more uh, segmented. Uh, it's not everything for everyone, but maybe we need to take a more segmented approach. And I'd like to, if the technology helps me, uh, show you a very short uh, trailer that we developed with European.
yes, I really just like the music. <laughs> that was the commercial break. Mm -hmm. It was, that the, was commercial the commercial break. break. <laughs> um, you'll notice that uh, even the music was uh, openly licensed. Uh, Goldberg variations, but uh, the artist who played it released it under CC by Z. Um, so yes, this was a bit of uh, a promotion, but it's also a way of you know, starting the debate. Uh, so what you'll notice is that we try to segment between, okay, sometimes you can't do everything as, a, as an institution. That's okay. You can still have restricted licenses. But you should know that if you release it more openly under higher qualities, then maybe you can expect more. That's sort of the direction that this is going. Do you think there's, that's a good way to move forward? Yeah, I think so. I think it's it's quite in line with what I said, that you can really look at things in a layered way, and this layered comments and the different degrees of openness can be useful. And I think indeed what, what is key there is that you do have to look at what your users want and what your content allows without unnecessarily adding rights that don't have to be there. You know, the, the big scheme that I showed, which was made by Andrea with the, what co so several institutions do and do not allow, she actually showed that in a presentation on what she called surrogate rights, which are in fact things that are in the public domain, but which have been appropriated rights by cultural institutions. And I find that a very interesting concept. You should really, there might be very good reasons for doing that at certain points in time, but you should really think twice before you add rights to something at a more restrictive level than what it should have. So I think that framework with the four layers might help people consider that in detail. So yeah, I think it's a good step. Excellent. Yeah, let's have some questions. Um, my name is Jacob, I'm with the National Museum of Denmark. Um, one of the things that I've been missing a little bit more on here today is, is discussion on orphan works. We've touched it a few times, but uh, at the National Museum, the vast majority of the photos that we have in the collection right now, the digital ones, it's uh, three quarters of a million roughly, are uh, orphan works. And, uh, and we kind of lack the resources to go through all of them and try to figure out uh, uh, who the authors <coughs> might be. And, and that's a very small amount of images compared to the images that are created in the present now. So when I imagine us 100 years from now trying to figure out who took all of the photographs that might end up in our collection from this present day, uh, I lose all hope. Um, and, and that's, uh, I think the, 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 the solution would not necessarily be to try to, to figure out who all of the creators are, but actually, as you say, Cedric, try to figure out a way to make the law more simple in terms of, uh, of copyright and understandable. Um, who, it's a question for you, Cedric. There is a lot of, uh, uh, lo the, the lobbyists around copyright are very strong. Copyright law is uh, increasingly uh, uh, created within the European Union. Uh, the member states are implementing directives, as you said, in a very fragmented way, in a very slow manner as well, uh, more often than not. Um, who's f and, and we're just small cultural institutions in terms of the whole broad landscape. You know your way around probably what's going on down there more than we do, Cedric. Who's fighting for the long tail? Who's fighting for the institutions that we, we know nothing about lobbying, right? We are in kindergarten when it comes to lobbying in terms of this whole uh, area of, of, of problems. When I'm attending meetings at the Cultural Ministry of Denmark, uh, uh, I'm uh, me and maybe another dude from the Royal Library and then 45 uh, representatives of right holders organizations. Um, Who's fighting for the small ones? Who's smiling, fighting for the, for the general users? And how much are Google fighting for, for, for us? Um, <laughs> so, the first thing is that who... Uh, Melissa said this morning that with just a few blog posts, she managed to have people understand things at UKIPO. And I think that uh, this is really important. It's not only happening in the secret of cabinets in Brussels. It's also happening online. People are reading you. Lawmakers are reading you. 
Lawmakers are reading petitions online, etc. So the kind, I mean, the, the, there's also, this is happening online. I mean, the, the creativity, etc., the issues. But I think that there's also, there should be forums online where this can happen too. Um, you've seen this with companies. When uh, Zuckerberg decided to change the terms of use of Facebook, there's been a protest on just Facebook, a group, saying, well, we don't want the changes, and they reverted. Of course, it's a business, and they listen to, to their clients. Not all politicians li listen to their constituents, but it's different. But still, uh, uh, the people I'm talking to at the commission, when I go there, but I will go back to this, they're reasonable, they understand things, but they just see, uh, for example, one Google, one representative of a consumer association, or representative of a library association, and 20 or 30 uh, representatives from studios, movie producers, uh, collecting societies. I say so. Why that? Because I'm going there from time to time. Not that often, you know. I've been at Google for two years. I think I've been in Brussels to, at the copyright units just five or six times. Me, working on copyright Google, okay, just to give you an idea of that. And when I go there, you know what I do? I look at the registry. You know, when you have to sign up at the desk when you enter, and for one me, there will be 20 people from rights holders uh, who, who have been there. And I understand this, you know, because it's normal to defend the, the, the rights. It's absolutely normal. The difference is that uh, maybe there's different in scale or difference in number of people. But still, uh, there are, I mean, so there are diff classical ways of lobbying, and it's happening in Brussels. To answer your questions, there's uh, the uh, IFLA, uh, which is the Association of Libraries, which is doing a lot. Uh, there might be others, I don't know, I'm not in touch with them. There's also C4C, Consumers for Creativity, which is a new uh, organization which is trying to let users um, have their voice in Brussels. It's not easy. Why? Because we have a long history of the debate on copyright being only the thing of copyright holders. Uh, why I'm saying this, uh, there was a consultation on copyright uh, launched by the Commission in the end of 2013, and for the first time, there's been 12,000 answers to the Constitution. 12,000. Usually, you count them in hundreds. You know, it's only uh, big companies and trade associations which have time uh, to, to answer to this. For the first time, there's been a massive democratic participation. And when you talk to people about this, say, look, People care. Users, uh, internet users care about this. Most of, not everyone, okay, most of, of the people, people who used to this debate, they have been there for a long time, they say, well, these are just members of the pirate parties. You, you just dismiss the, the, the voice. Just, you don't want to hear them. So I think it's also this. The more there will be participation, everywhere, not just in Brussels, also online, on blogs, on forums, etc. I think something may happen. But it could take a while because this, what I was describing, the phenomenon of change of uh, center of gravity in creation, it's only because people bump into copyright law that they would understand that something is happening and they also need to get this. But also because most of that is for non-commercial purposes, no one really cares. There's no, no uh, commercial interest at, at stake. So because there's no commercial interest, again, those who lobby will be me and people on the other side. So it's also why the debate is partly biased. Still, things happen. Remember why ACTA was defeated? Uh, why the European Parliament de decided to fight to, to uh, reject the treaty on uh, which w w uh, created more severe uh, repression of uh, intellectual property infringement. It's because during, because during the cold winter in Poland, there were people who actually went in the streets to, to, uh, to say, well, I don't want my internet to be broken. So you see, things can happen. So uh, uh, I'm not as pessimistic as you are. I'm just saying that we need to have more people like you. And of course, you don't know how to do this. It's costly, it's, it's expensive, etc. But still, uh, you can do otherwise. There's not just the Brussels Channel. There might be other ways to do it. Blog post with by Melissa. That's the starting point. OK. Merit. Yeah, I have a question um, related to the 99%, which is really mind-blowing to think about uh, the amount of pictures taken every day by all of us, and suddenly we're all systematically or automatically rights holders, even without thinking about it. However, I was thinking uh, what uh, was discussed in the panel debate earlier today, um, where uh, you pointed out that uh, 
um, the copyright protection is there to ensure that even though an artwork or a photograph doesn't uh, have a lot of value when it's created and maybe sold too cheaply, uh, it can uh, raise its value uh, later on. So is it a good thing, even though, to have the copyright protection automatically step in if it should happen that just 1% of the 99% becomes famous photographs that could earn the rights holder money? Um, before joining Google, I was in the academic world, so I think I'm better at asking questions than giving answers. <laughs> um, so, um, I don't have a solution for everything. I'm, I'm, just, I'm working for an American company. Uh, where the system in the US is if you want to um, uh, claim your right on a photo or a video or something, you m first have to register it. There's a formality requirement. If you don't do this, then uh, you, you will be barred from uh, claiming before a court. I think this is interesting. It also means that there, there is a mechanism by which you intend to become part of the grown-up. And, but if, as long as you're not there, you, you, you declare to the world that you're, you don't want to do this. I mean, so there might be a way with formalities to clear or to solve some of the issues uh, we discussed. But it's not, I, think, I don't think it's the optimal way of doing this. Uh, again, and this is something which has been discussed uh, today, there's this... Um, the two worlds, non-commercial and, commo and commercial worlds that we've identified and the solutions that exist in one world do not apply to the other world, but it's true that you can cross uh, worlds, you can move from, from another, and here this is really something uh, on which academics and others have th they've thought of it for a while, but it's hard, to, um, it's hard to find a solution for um, that would, uh, let's say, that would uh, be expressed in this way. So that's why in one of my slides I said, well, we should have exceptions or we should have mechanisms which are flexible enough to accommodate everyone. So as long as I'm using a photo, so that's the fair use system, for example. If I'm using a photo without uh, creating any, any economic damage, it's okay. But if I know that at some point the same photo has an economic value, I'm not supposed to use it anymore. So for the same photo and with the same rule, you can have two different solutions when you look at, when you assess the environment and the facts. And if this is something which is possible in fair use system. It's not possible with um, the existing copyright exception system in Europe. So because it's closed and because it's too rigid, so maybe that's a way forward. But I hate seeing this because, you know, we say, oh, come on, the guy wants to colonize Europe with the US standard, etc. We may come with solutions of our own. Again, it's not me. You know, it's not me uh, suggesting mm. solutions. I think it should be everyone's uh, mission to think of it. If I can just comment on that, because I think that ties back into the lobbying and, and the question you rightfully asked. And I think it's true that the way to help come up with solutions is also just simply to show what could be done if the copyright framework was a bit less restrictive. So work with what you can work with, with Creative Commons licensed content, with public domain content, do those great reuse initiatives and show how much people get into them and how much more you engage with your users. And I called it, um, when we discussed it with Harry before the conference, I called it lobbying by evidence. And it sounds stupidly naive that the fact Someone that you tweet show... That, please. Lobbying by evidence, I love that. That, that if you show something by evidence that it might be a good thing if copyright wasn't so horribly restrictive for so horribly long. Because let's face it, no single artist is ever going to not create a work of art because he's not going to be protected for 70 years after his death. That, that for, to begin with, to me, is one of the parts of copyright which seems very over the top. So if you can show what can be done by things that are not so restricted by copyright, I think that really helps organizations that do lobby, so, such as the library organization or Europeana as well, to really show, look, if only we could do slightly more, then look at all this wonderful thing that's happening, because the European Commission and all the European institutions want Europe to come together around this heritage. And if you can show the case that having slightly less strict copyright would really help, that in itself would help us lobby, I think, as a sector. I agree. Um, 
but shouldn't we also uh, call a botched job a botched job uh, like the orphans uh, directive? It's <laughs> it's completely flawed, and I wouldn't entertain it any longer. And as Europeana, if it don't work, don't support it with the with the rights label. Or maybe some someone should take a stance and declare the failure that it is. Uh, or uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not well, sure. Uh, should, yeah, should a, should hmm? a quick comment on this. I mean, no. we have the beginning of it. It's here. Martin, sh again, you. Uh, you showed this. You said, well, in Netherlands, we only have this number of. Uh, uh, I don't know who was, was there. Melissa, it was Melissa, yes. yes. And uh, at the European level, uh, the Hohim database also shows that there are only hundreds. I think uh, uh, works like this. So people start to understand that it's a failure. But the problem with the uh, European lawmaking is that usually the impact assessment comes ten years after. So, for example, with the database directive, which was taken in 1996, in 2006, we had economists say, well, this has been a complete failure. But it took 10 years to acknowledge this. So that's also the problem here, is that uh, lobbying by evidence is fine, but the problem is that the uh, lawmaking system sometimes only look at, you know, evidence too late. So, uh, again, uh, this is, it's not only about copyright, it's about how we want law to be uh, created in the future. Okay, okay. Um, any more questions? Burning things on your mind? No? I'd like to thank you very much, Cédric, Eva. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. And I think then we're, uh, we're up for a well-deserved coffee break. We didn't have coffee after lunch. Uh, so coffee over there. Reproductions of Van Gogh over there. Thank you. 15 minutes.